Because our next speaker is fluent uh, in Norwegian anyway. Right? What? Um, so he's come all the way from um, Canada uh, and he's got some very interesting things he's going to talk about. Um, uh, so whether you are in uh, with the national guidelines, I guess there aren't many who believe in the uh, in the official Norwegian dietary guidelines here, uh, but also the so-called low-carb, hardcore low-carb people. Um, I would say to both of those groups that um, there are things that are not as easy, uh, easily explainable um, um, in terms of um, why a low-carb diet is good and, and why also some people can uh, not eat a low-carb diet and still maintain uh, their health. So um, that's one of the things you're going to get into. So uh, without further ado, um, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And thank you to uh, Costa for the organizers for having me here to speak. Uh, so we're going to start with a bit of an odd one out. We've got here three uh, different adverts from people who'd like you to get to eat their product or use their product and are maintaining that it's either benign or that, that it's actually good for you. Uh, the answer's going to come up at the end, of course, it's a bit of a trick question. So, this is a hypothesis I came up with when I was troubleshooting my own health. I ballooned to, you know, on the standard American diet, and realized that I had to do something to drop some weight. I went via the low-carb option because a good friend of mine was a surgeon who swore by low-carbing. Uh, that sort of stopped working about halfway, <coughs> and I tried a, a variety of different things, trying crazy levels of fat replacing protein and a lot of the other tricks that were being talked about online. Uh, then I, but that didn't seem to do any good, and then I went to free, but because I replaced the last little bit of bread I was eating with uh, a gluten-free bread alternative, again my weight was still stuck. And uh, it was in the end when I went to a, a Paleolithic style diet using whole foods and nothing but uh, whole foods, fresh fruit and veg. But even though this was a, a high carbohydrate option because I wasn't a big fan of ketosis by this point, then that caused uh, an enormous amount of further weight loss and a lot of my other health problems cleared up. So as a scientist, I was sitting there thinking, well, how can this work? And due to my uh, position working in a gastro uh, gastroenterology unit, I uh, was in the right position to come up with the following set of ideas. So this way of looking at obesity stands upon the pillars that obesity is a disorder of energy homeostasis, that this thing called leptin resistance involving uh, a malfunction of the, the body's uh, fat thermostat, for want of a better word, is causal, and it's the malfunction of this that's led people to be overweight. It, uh, it observes that energy homeostasis seems to work well in pre-industrial and pre especially pre-agricultural diets, even when these peoples have uh, an excess of food, so they have plenty of opportunity to eat too much. The hypothesis suggests that obesity is essentially a bacterial disorder, and it's the misbehavior of the bacteria in our intestines that's altering our behavior with regard to how hungry we are and how much energy we're exerting. And uh, once you start following the chain of dominoes that falls down, you see that this could be the enabling factor in uh, a good deal of the diseases of civilization. So we're going to rush through uh, an overview of uh, what we know about obesity, the health of non-Western <coughs> people, the apparent macronutrient independence of ancestral diets that may be very important. And the facets of Western diet that seem to be a problem, including Westernized carbohydrate. Then we're going to have a quick run through the gastrointestinal microbiota. Not so much the details <coughs> of the microbiota, and it's got plenty of that. It's more to impress upon you the sheer power that these bacteria that live in your belly have over the behavior that we express with regard to food and metabolism. Uh, to make a play for arguing that the action's actually going on higher up in the gut than in the colon, despite the fact that the colon's got more bacteria, and then to take you through uh, the hypothesis that I come up with and hopefully convince you that it's a reasonable thing to suggest, although obviously as a hypothesis we can't prove anything yet. 
So obesity, a growing problem, the oldest part of the book. Uh, the Western world's got a series of obesity issues. Diabetes is increasing. It's costing our health care systems uh, an astronomical amount. The United States seems to be the worst affected country, and it's non-Europeans who seem to be the most susceptible. The obese do tend to eat more and move less, but it looks, the, if you look at the evidence with an open mind, it looks as though that it's because of not so much that they ended up being overweight because they didn't move enough and because they, uh, they ate too much, but there's something about <coughs> their fat thermostat changed and that they moved less and ate more. Uh, in order to uh, fulfill the demands of that fat thermostat within their nervous system. Uh, the evidence of this is that if you get uh, people who've lost weight to, uh, if you look at people who exercise a lot versus people who don't exercise much at all, the people who exercise the most are still only blunting the weight regain. As everyone knows, it's not easy to keep the pounds off because the system's fighting you all the way. And it's now been shown that after weight loss, your total energy expenditure drops as the system's working as hard as it can to keep those pounds on because it's convinced you need them. Uh, we know that overweight's a big risk factor for a lot of conditions and most of the uh, what we call the Western diseases. The abdominal adiposity, that special fat on the waistline, seems to be an especially good indicator of risk. So a quick overview of energy homeostasis. The the brain uh, obviously wants to keep a certain level of fat tissue on the body, and fat tissue reports back to the brain that it's there using this reporter hormone leptin, which regulates uh, hunger and uh, uh, also energy expenditure. And one of the things that's seen in people who are overweight is that leptin seems to work less well, uh, so the signal's got not getting through. The brain interprets this as that you're underweight and need to eat more, and it affects change by increasing your appetite and also, we know, no decreasing the level of energy that you're expending, which of course has its desired result usually. The amount of uh, adipose tissue increases, extra leptin is secreted, and some of that overcomes uh, some of the blockade, and uh, so you know, people who are overweight tend to guard that overweight level or only gain weight slowly. So it was reported by people throughout uh, uh, the colonial times uh, when people, uh, Europeans were moving out to live in Africa and Asia, but non-Westernized people seemed to be free of a lot of the diseases that, uh, that the European patients they had were suffering from, including overweight, obesity, heart disease, stroke. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, some of these factors because they're, they're really excellently summarized in Stefan Lindbergh's textbook, Food and Western Disease, which uh, people haven't read that, I strongly recommend it because it's a great overview of uh, a lot of the background to this talk. So uh, these days, of course, the situation is not so good and uh, these same people are, if anything, more severely affected once they start eating Western foods. Fortunately, uh, although we exported our Western foods faster than we exported our epidemiologists to study the phenomenon, there were enough uh, peoples who did not adopt the Western lifestyle and live without Western foods that retained this excellent health for us to study. Uh, this particular study is probably the best one that I'm aware of. It was carried out in the 1990s by Stefan Lindbergh and his colleagues on the island of Catava, which is off of Papua New Guinea. It's the very tiny dot next to the other tiny dot. Uh, they have a diet that's very high in carbohydrate, root vegetables, about 70% of energy is from carbs. Uh, which immediately when you're a low carb, your heckles go up and you hear this and you think this is unusual because I know what happens if I eat bread. And they, they have a tiny amount of uh, fish protein often in uh, evening meals. And they eat about 17% of their energy in the form of uh, saturated fat from coconuts. So they've got a decent saturated fat intake just to keep the uh, cardiologists confused. 